STL TV, we're recording? Yes. Okay, then. Uh, welcome, everyone, to the Parks and Environmental Matters Committee meeting for Tuesday, January 24th, 2023. Uh, Madam Clerk, will you please call the roll? Alderman Vaccaro. Present. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Present. Alderman Bosley. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Alderman Todd. Present. Alderman Page. Present. Alderwoman Peel. Alderman Grass. Here. Alderwoman Walker. Present. Chair Gunther. Here. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderman Bosley. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Alderwoman Peel. We have seven present. We have a quorum. Okay, thank you. Uh, next on the agenda will be the approval of the minutes. Uh, we have minutes from Thursday, July 14th. I will entertain a motion for the approval. I'll make a motion. We approve the minutes from the July 14th meeting. Second. Madam Clerk, please call the roll. Alderman Vaccaro. Aye. Alderwoman Tyus. Alderwoman Boyd. Aye. Alderman Bosley. Alderwoman Clark Hubbard. Alderman Todd. Aye. Alderman Page. Aye. Alderwoman Peel. Here. <laughs> Oops. We're approving the minutes. So are you, you're voting aye for the minutes? Alderwoman Peel? Aye. Alderman Grass? Alderwoman Walker? Aye. Chair Gunther? Aye. Alderman, Alderwoman Tyus? Alderman Bosley? Alderwoman Clark Hubbard? Alderman Grass. Hi, I'm sorry. I thought I said it before. We have eight eye votes. All right, with the vote, the motion to approve the minutes uh, goes forward. Um, so today's committee hearing, we have, uh, there were three board bills that were placed um, basically since I took over the parks committee. Uh, we're looking at what was sent to parks and just kind of not heard for the uh, year and trying to get these uh, items heard. Um, item number one that's on there, uh, sponsored by Alderman Todd, uh, is Board Bill 86. Um, from my conversations with Alderman Todd and also with uh, Greg Hayes of the Parks Department, it sounds like um, this is something that we're just gonna kind of hold. Uh, Alderman Todd, do you wanna speak on that really quickly? Yes, we, we're gonna hold it because uh, uh, Director Hayes said he wanted to deal with that in-house. Okay, perfect. Um, and thank you for uh, for being able to, or being willing to uh, let the um, Parks and Recreation and Forestry Department head uh, kind of take that one up. Um, item number two that we have is Board Bill 109, uh, sponsored by uh, Alderman from the 28th, uh, Alderman Grass. Uh, from speaking with him, it sounded like there were some people that wanted to speak on this bill that had not gotten their names on the list. Um, Alderman Grass, can you uh, speak for just a second on whether uh, you were able to get those people um, confirmed or should we wait? You know, I, I think we would have a much more fruitful meeting if we were able to wait until uh, next year. I apologize for that. But if we were able to wait till next week, I should say or just reschedule the meeting. But, um, you know, this is kind of one of those bills that's, that's subtle and there's a lot of, uh, there, there's it's easy to get it kind of like in, in the weed. So um, I think we do uh, benefit from having um, the witnesses present. So if we could reschedule and I'm really sorry to do that and I hate to do it, um, but unfortunately the bill's not ready to be heard today. Gotcha. And members of the, um, of the committee, I spoke with, uh, Alderman Grass yesterday about this. Um, and as of right now, kind of looking at next week, um, if we did want to try to hear it, um, 
before Friday when our um, agenda comes out for the week, like right now, really Wednesday afternoon or late Thursday um, would be the only two times I had available. So just kind of keep that in the back of your head that um, we might go ahead and try to schedule something for next week uh, to try to hear some um, testimony on Board Bill 109. Um, and Alderman Gross, also, I, I did look through kind of my history of emails on the last time we spoke about this, and it looked like there was a lot of input from um, the comptroller's office. So can you reach out to them as well? Because uh, I believe they're the ones that kind of coordinate the PACE um, programs um, and just see if uh, someone from the comptroller's office would be willing to speak as well um, as the as in addition to the people that you have. So no, ab absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I, I want to get a fruitful hearing. So I'd like to hear as many voice voices as possible. So definitely. All right, wonderful. So item number two, we're going to hold. Uh, so we're working our way through quickly here. Um, item number three is uh, Board Bill 174 by Alderman Todd. Um, we do have some speakers for this. Um, so uh, I will uh, hand it over. Alderman Todd, would you, I guess, like to make a motion and bring Board Bill 174 before us? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, uh, committee people, all the people. Uh, I would like to bring Board Bill 174 before the uh, committee. It's a very, um, it's a bill that uh, requests that we stop using noxious plant uh, plant killer and use more healthy plant killers because we've had incidents where people that have gotten sick, and I think someone even passed, and the city has been sued. So. It would be, uh, so that's the uh, uh, main point of the bill, but I do have guest speakers, uh, Mr. Chairman, and I want to know if you can bring them on, they can explain the bill further because they have more knowledge, in-depth knowledge than I do about it. Absolutely, thank you, Alderman Todd. Um, so we have, I see, looks like four speakers here. Um, Madam Clerk, can you go ahead and swear them in? Yes. Can you please raise your right hand? Thank you. Do you affirm that the testimony that you are about to give is the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth? All right, looks like I we can't have- I can't hear anyone. I do. <laughs> I do. I do. I do. Thank you. I saw four heads shaking yes, so I was gonna take that as a yes. Um, okay, so uh, I guess, Madam Clerk, can you go ahead and um, call them as they are listed in our speaker list uh, to come through? And I believe um, we'll have about three minutes of testimony. And then um, after the three minutes, then we'll move on to the next speaker. So. Okay, the first name, and I hope, hopefully I pronounced this correctly, Barbara Chichirio. That, that was pretty good, Chicario. Chicario. Yeah, thank you. Um, I hope that you all had a chance to read through the uh, proposed bill, uh, bill number 174. Yes, I'm Barb Chicario, and I want to thank the P Parks and Environmental Matters Committee for giving me the opportunity to speak in favor of Board Bill 174, he Healthy Outdoor Spaces, and to voice my grave concern about the use of harmful pesticides in our city parks. There are many reasons that red flags are being raised about the dangers of pesticide use from human health to species extinction, but the city of St. Louis needs to be aware that there is also a great financial cost that we could bear. This financial cost could come in the form of liability brought forth by using dangerous pesticides in city parks. Not only are children in danger of this exposure, but city workers that handle this poison, these poisonous chemicals are also at great risk. In 2018, Bayer bought Monsanto, the producer of the herbicide Roundup. Bayer also inherited the liability for Roundup litigation. In the 1990s, Earl Neal worked for St. Louis City Parks Department and was later diagnosed with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. In 2017, dozens of plaintiffs from around the US, including the lead plaintiff, Earl Neal, who was exposed to Roundup while working for the St. Louis City Parks Department and the St. Louis City Forestry Department, were settled in 
2022, and Neil was awarded $8 million. This is only one example, and the agrochemical giant Bayer has literally lost billions of dollars in litigation involving people sickened by their product Roundup. Because of the liability, Bayer announced that the company would stop selling their popular weed killer Roundup to residential consumers this year, 2023. Glyphosate, which is the primary ingredient in the herbicide, has been the focus of lawsuits and controversy for many years. What Bayer lawyers are now attempting to do, and I believe that ultimately they will be successful, is to settle the remaining 108,000 cases out of 138,000, put some amount in a fund for the cases that come up afterwards, after those 138 are settled, and after that fund is drained, Bayer will not have any liability. They'll be done. At this point, the next target for lawsuits could be the employer, St. Louis City, or the owner of property where exposure took place, the St. Louis City Parks. The liability could land right on the steps of St. Louis City Hall. If dangers to park users or to city employees are not enough to change minds about using poisonous pesticides and herbicides in our parks, then perhaps the financial liability could be a wake-up call. And I want to finish here with a quote from Rachel Carson. Pesticides are a concern to all of us. If we are going to live so intimately with these chemicals, eating and drinking them, taking them into the very marrow of our bones, we had better know something about their nature and their power. So please support Board Bill 174. And again, I thank you for giving me the time to speak. Okay. I was just gonna say thank you and who uh, called the next <clears throat> speaker. Next, we have Daniel Romano. Um. Hello, I would like to, I'm Daniel Romano. I would like to speak in favor of Ward Bill 174 and I'd like to give some background. Um, I will try to be as brief as I can, but there's a lot of information here. Um, in uh, July of uh, 2020, um, I filed the Sunshine Law request on behalf of the St. Louis No Spray Coalition and the Green Party of St. Louis. Uh, we were met with a lot of resistance from the city to turn over records of pesticide use and cost of pesticide use. And to this day, we have never received complete records. Thanks to the help of uh, then Alderman Green and the Great Rivers Environmental Law Center intervening on our behalf, we did get many of these records and it was finally uh, almost two years later. What we found was a, a quite a, a toxic list of pesticides Remember, a pesticide is an herbicide also used by the city of St. Louis, and many are possible, possible or probable carcinogens and, are, and um, are known to cause other human health problems and environmental damage. Uh, the city is using large amounts of these toxic chemicals in our parks and public spaces. And remember, this bill would only limit use in parks and public spaces owned by the city of St. Louis. They use these without warning and usually without notifying the public uh, of the use. For example, from 2016 to 2021, these are the latest years we have data for, um, they sprayed approximately 520 uh, gallons of glyphosate bearing products, usually in the form of Roundup Ultra. Uh, this powerful, remember that 520 gallons is a concentrate, which needs to be diluted up to 200 times, uh, up to 200 times before it is sprayed. Um, let me tell you some of the other things we found they were using. Um, aqua resin. This is a, an insecticide. It is, um, this, its active ingre ingredient is permethrin which has been shown to cause tumors in rats, which means cancer. It also has another ingredient, piperonal butoxide. The EPA lists this also as a suspected carcinogen. <clears throat> Treflon is a pre-emergent herbicide. Its active ingredient, trifluralin, is a possible 
carcinogen listed by the EPA and is shown to be highly persistent uh, and toxic to aquatic organisms. Evade, uh, a Loveland, prod a Loveland products, um, uh, this is a pre-emergent herbicide, prodiamine, another suspected uh, carcinogen and causing other negative health effects in animals. Uh, Lesco prosecutor is uh, an herbicide manufactured by Bayer. It is another glyphosate-bearing uh, product. Pendulum, uh, a pre-emergent uh, herbicide for broadleaf weeds. Uh, this is listed, uh, oh, one of its ingredients, naphthalene, is um, known to the state of California to cause cancer. There's there are others, but those are the worst. Um, now, I have talked to Mr. Greg Hayes of the St. Louis Parks Department and William Ryan of um, Tower Grove Park. Uh, they will tell you that we use these sparingly, but... Um, Indications from the research we found from city records indicates they use quite a bit, spending upwards of $10,000 a year on these uh, pesticides and applicators. And that's only a partial list. Plus, not, that doesn't include the fact that, that you have to hire people and licensed applicators to do that, which is not listed and adds to the cost. Uh, they will also say that, oh, it's very expensive. Uh, but right now in, in this country, there's 130 other cities that have enacted these no spray pesticide bans. Uh, and our the submitted bill, Board Bill 174, is based on actual legislation used in other cities, such as New York City, Philadelphia, Chicago is imposed. That's a partial ban just on uh, pesticides. Uh, Wellesley, Massachusetts, which instituted a program such as this 20 years ago, very successfully. Um, and uh, in South Miami, uh, Florida, um, they uh, used uh, these, you know, this, this program of you know, using no uh, chemical pesticides. And um, they here, I'm gonna quote from what a uh, city memo from that city. Um, the, the, our initiative has been a qualified success, allowing the city, again, this is South Miami, Florida, to cut down on uh, its waste footprint significantly, cut down on its use of pesticides at relatively little expense, providing a model for other uh, local governments to use as guidance. So uh, what I'm trying to tell you is that this is not, uh, you know, a, a, an out there idea. This is something that is becoming the norm. This is becoming uh, very typical for many cities. Um, let's see, the alternatives uh, are, um, According to a Beyond Pesticide study, when you use the alternatives in the first two years, because of the changeover, it, it might raise costs some. But in the long run, usually after two years, there are significant savings. Uh, when we talk about you know the cost of these uh, programs too, we must remember the hundreds of billions of dollars in liability that. Uh, corporations that manufacture uh, these kind of products, especially Bayer, formerly Monsanto, which is uh, spent over a hundred billion dollars in liability. And many of the cases are still active. If once the uh, liability agree agreement ends, and it will, that it will be part of this final settlement with Bayer, who is going to be liable for the cancers and other human um, you know, health problems that result from the use of these products. It will be the applicator. In other words, the city of St. Louis could become liable. Uh, Barbara Ch Ch Chicario just mentioned Earl Neal. I personally um, interviewed him. The man did not know it, but he had cancer and it's going to shorten his life. Mr. Neal is still alive and living uh, in St. Louis County. Uh, but again, he was an applicator. He worked for the um, city 
uh, doing groundskeeping and clearing um, forestry is the division he worked for. And he was never told that he was even using pesticides, never told that um, the possible um, you know, effects that could you know, affect his health. And they was given no training at all on how to protect himself, no protective gear. Um, again, you will, if you know, there are effective ways that are being used by these cities, such as mulching, hand weeding, planting, uh, you know, uh, crops uh, or plants thickly to, that could be used and are being used instead of using this um, array of toxic and dangerous pesticides in our city parks and public spaces. I urge this uh, committee to recommend to bring this to the full um, you know, Board of Aldermen, uh, Board Bill 174, so that they can vote on it and protect our children, our health, and our workers, and our environment. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Romano. Uh, Madam Clerk, who's our next speaker? We have Jennifer Johnson. Hello. So I'm Jennifer Johnson, a resident of St. Louis City for 23 years, living all around Tower Grove Park and now in North City. My husband and I have a son, Henry, who loves nature, who just turned four in December. We visit many city parks, including Tower Grove Park and Forest Park. Henry can name most of the trees in the park and the weeds and the wildflowers. His first experience with nature was Tower Grove Park as a tiny infant. We play with pine cones and acorns, leaves, sticks, and feathers. He can make the whole loop of Tower Grove Park walking three and a half miles, stopping at our favorite spots. A certain maple tree he calls his girlfriend tree. We stop at the tropics by Piper Palm House where the banana trees and palm trees are planted in the summer. But this is one of the most heavily manicured and toxically sprayed areas. So I do not let him play much here even though it, he loves it. We love the twisted magnolias that all the children like to play under and in. But these are always heavily sprayed beneath because they have low branches that are hard to mow under. So I can't let Henry touch the soil. Since he could crawl, I have taught him not to go into the circle of death around each tree where the ground has been sprayed extremely obviously with persistent herbicides. Henry helps me pull weeds in the playgrounds to try to prevent spray there. Henry was so excited this past spring to see all the new plants coming up and the trees blooming and leafing out, learning to name the plants in different seasons. It was so disheartening to see the new rings of death appear around every tree. More trees were sprayed this year than in the past, many so heavily that some of the smaller ornamentals died, including some beautiful plums and service berries. The grass and plants around each tree died in a perfect circle. Huge mulch beds and blankets of needles below pine and bald cypress trees, which are otherwise wonderful play areas, were sprayed to eliminate the need to weed eat or mow. It really breaks my heart that Henry cannot play under these trees. When he was littler, he would put things in his mouth, but even now, though the acorns and sticks don't get chewed on, his hands touch his face and mouth, and many toxins can be absorbed transdermally. Just speaking to glyphosate, one of the active ingredients of Roundup, though it is claimed to not have harmful action on human cells, it does act on bacteria and fungus. We have trillions of these microorganisms in our bodies, that make up our microbiome, outnumbering our human cells 10 to one. We rely on these to process our food and vitamins, to act as part of our immune system and to affect our gut brain interactions. Roundup harms our microbiomes, which is particularly harmful to children as their microbiomes and immune systems and brains are developing and early damage to this can cause lifelong harm. Before I had Henry, I was a nurse at Cochrane VA and at Big Barnes. Some of the most frustrating diseases to treat were autoimmune and neurodegenerative diseases, the rapid increase of which has shown direct correlation with the increased use of toxic chemicals, including pesticides and herbicides. I would like St. Louis to help stop this increase, particularly in areas where our children are most vulnerable. Thank you. And I have, um, 
I think that was three minutes. I have one more thing to add here. My son fell asleep on my lap right before <laughs> the meeting. Um, he was actually kind of excited to watch it, but that's the reason <laughs> I'm concerned about this. That, so thank you. Thank you, Miss Johnson. And uh, luckily for your son, uh, we have all these on YouTube, so you can play it back <laughs> for him later. So. I can, I can show him, mommy. Yeah. <laughs> um, then it looks like that means uh, Aaron O'Reilly will be our last speaker. Okay. Hello. Good afternoon, and thank you for letting me speak on behalf of Board Bill Number One Seventy Four. My name is Erin O'Reilly, and I've been a frequent park user since the 1970s when I moved to St. Louis to, for nursing school. I have a master's in community health nursing and have worked since the 1980s with mothers and babies in community-centered maternal child care. I am also a lactation consultant supporting breastfeeding mothers and babies. As a community health nurse specializing in maternal child health, I know how important a clean and healthy environment is for mothers and babies. So I am very concerned about the chemical herbicides and pesticides regularly used in our parks, which accumulate in the soil and environment and make our parks less healthy and even hazardous. Our parks are precious resources and they are important to our citizens' health and well being. We want our citizens to feel safe using our parks and to gain the health and well being from being close to nature in healthy settings. In Tower Grove Park, where I do volunteer work, and I've walked several times a week for the past 38 plus years, I have seen the harmful chemicals being sprayed and utilized more so in recent years. I and several others started looking into just how many and how much harmful chemicals are being used in our parks and our other city public lands. Healthy parks are especially important for families with young children, children and babies who are smaller than adults and are, are more vulnerable to these harmful chemicals due to their fast growth rates. They also tend to play close to the ground and thus are more at risk for exposure to these harmful chemicals, as Jen was talking about. When people are exposed to these poisons, they have higher risk of cancers like lymphomas and leukemias, but also neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's disease and even the metabolic diseases. Respiratory illnesses, including asthma and COPD, can also result from exposure to sprayed herbicide toxins. These are all disabling chronic diseases, which are increasing in incidence as chemical usage in our public spaces has increased. Exposure at younger ages and regular exposures to park workers lead to higher risks of these negative outcomes. As we all know, Illness is very costly and negatively affects the quality of life and the productivity of our citizens. Utilizing the Sunshine Law to request these documents, we now know that there are lots of toxic chemicals being used for weed and pest control in our parks and public spaces. This legislative bill, similar to the legislation that has been enacted in over 130 other major cities, has been written for the purpose of changing this trend of using these harmful chemicals to more natural and healthier methods of weed and pest control. We hope that this proposed legislation will be enacted to protect the health of our city parks and our environment, and of course, the health of our citizens who use these spaces. Thank you to Alderman Todd for working with us and for introducing this bill. And thank you to the rest of this aldermanic committee for giving us, for giving this bill your serious consideration and hopefully your so, full support. All right, thank you, uh, Ms. O'Reilly. Um, so I do see a hand raised uh, from the alderwoman from the 17th. Um, I think we'll go through the committee members to see if they have any questions from the speakers. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and, and ask, uh, go to Alderman Todd um, to go through questions about the bill itself. So uh, Alderwoman Peel, did you have a question for the speakers? Uh, yeah, thank you, um, Chairman Gunther. 
I will switch off my video. Uh, yes, I wanted to just know, um, Daniel, uh, what organization are, are you representing? I am with uh, the um, St. Louis No Spray Coalition. It's an ad hoc uh, citizens organization that's um, specifically focused on this bill and the Green Party of St. Louis, which works on a wide variety of uh, civic and environmental issues in this area. We are associated with the uh, National Green Party. Great, thank you. Um, a question I have for you is, you mentioned Wellesley, Massachusetts um, has implemented this um, no spray, and you said that uh, it has been really successful. So I would love to know, give me a few points regarding um, what is success and how they were able to stop spraying with these pesticides and uh, still continue to keep out the weeds. Yes, thank you. Um, so uh, for one thing is they, you know, I and I am more than willing to send everyone, um, you know, uh, information where you can go to their website and see for yourself. Uh, basically, um, the main thing is, is that you use, um, you know, uh, mulch is one of the guest things. This is where you put organic matter over an area up to a couple inches, and this can you know prevent the weeds. Uh, there's some some cities would use other methods. Uh, another thing that is in problematic areas is you use hand weeding. Is you might say, and now people will often say, well, well, you know, hand weeding that's going to be expensive. Uh, the hand weeding, of course, eliminates the uh, use of costly pesticides. Um, it, you know, it can be used as a uh, summer jobs program for young people or anyone that wants. Uh, it, it's a lot safer. It avoids the liability associated with using uh, chemical pesticides. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's very effective. Um, other methods they use is you can plant your, and you might even see this if you go to Missouri Botanical Gardens, their new center out front, you can see where there are uh, native plants that you can plant so they grow thickly in an area and will thrive and you no know, weeds don't have a chance to come up. Um, you know, it's, there's some park administrators and others that want a you know perfectly clean park with not a weed in it um i feel like this is unnecessary and um you know you could you know you got to change your attitude toward the whole idea of a weed and uh, there are you know these methods as i just described and as if you go to the wellesley massachusetts place you'll see that these you know they can maintain, especially dangerous, not noxious, and and um, non-native plants. O also, one other thing, um, Alderman Peel, I'd like to point out is that some might argue that there are some weeds, uh, such as the um, um, what is it, the uh, invasive plant from Asia. Um, um, anyway. There is a variance. There is a thing in there where they can apply to use uh, a limited use of pesticides um, on these invasive weeds and, and stop that. Because the invasive plants uh, and, you know, exotic invasive plants can be a problem. And this bill allows for that. But a committee such as this committee would have to approve it so they couldn't just use it and use it as a loophole to continue what they're doing. Thank you for that information. Um, I wanted to just see what specific examples uh, you could provide me. Is that the honeysuckle that you were talking about? Is that correct? Yeah. <laughs> so um, the other question I had um, was for um, Barbara. And uh, just uh, I was wondering if you're with an organization or just as an individual, too. I didn't hear um, that. Huh. Oh yeah, actually I'm with the No Spray Coalition and the St. Louis Green Party. So Daniel and I are in the same organizations. Okay, great, thank you. Uh huh. And I also wanted to say about alternatives in the park, 
Daniel described it, described it very well, but by doing density in planting and planting perennials, that means they come up every year. You don't have to worry about uh, have, you know, having annuals planted because uh, when the perennials, once they take root, they do very well. So that, that's just one more thought. Thank you. Um, I know when I am planting myself, uh, you know, one of the biggest things is to plant hostas. Um, they are able to um, keep out the weeds very well. Um, I'd love to know of other plants that do that uh, in terms of being able to uh, keep the weeds at bay very, very well. So I know hostas are, are a big one that you can use very easily as a perennial. Oh, and you know what? I'm sorry. I my husband's reminding me. I'm also a member of Sierra Club and very active in Mo, uh, Missouri Coalition for the Environment. So uh, those are my other two organizations. Thank you. Is that all, Alderman Peel? Yes. Yes, that's all. Okay. Uh, did any other committee members have questions for the speakers? Um, seeing no hands, um, I did have a couple of questions. Um, so, uh, oh, wait, I'll let, uh, I'll let Alderman Page go. All right, Alderman Page, you're, you're welcome to ask questions of the speakers. Yes, uh, thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'd like to address this to each of the speakers. And before I even uh, put my question into the universe, I want it to be perfectly clear that I am a 100,000 year plus member of the Sierra Club, a founding member of the Missouri Coalition, Clean Energy Coalition. And uh, so I am very, very concerned about less than judicial use of herbicides and pesticides. Let me get that on the record. Uh, I'm very concerned about less than judicious application of herbicides and pesticides on people like the young man, uh, Henry, I think his name is, that was on the lap of one of our speakers. Uh, that's near and dear to my heart. Sorry, I had a phone call to interrupt me. But anyway, having said all of that, every single one of the city agencies that provide city services in the city of St. Louis, they're all shorthanded. They're all short staffed. Um, that includes streets. Uh, that includes forestry, which probably uh, comes into play. It includes parks. All of our city agencies are shorthanded. So I understand that probably a calculus is made that they can remove more weeds or prevent more weeds using um, various herbicides, uh, given that and they can get more done with fewer people. Now, I would never want to sacrifice the health of people for economic efficiency. But having said all of this, I would ask all of our speakers, if they care to weigh in, how do we strike this balance in city government with getting the work that needs to be done uh, versus um, if we're going to move away from potentially harmful pesticides and um, herbicides? How are we going to get this work done given our short staff situation? A lot of the alternatives I heard today, which I'm very familiar with, uh, mulching, hand weeding, very labor intensive. If we could come up with armies of volunteers, I think that would work. How would our speakers recommend that the city resolve this conundrum? I'd like to answer that. So, um, as you know, um, the city employs a lot of people already in maintenance 
and um, weed control and, um, you know, um, my reading of other cities that have implemented programs like this that are facing, of course, the, the same sorts of problems we have here, you know, not having enough people to cover all the all the various jobs. Uh, my sense is, is that for one thing, you're going to uh, not so much hire so many more people as convert the people who are already doing this sort of work into this new system of um, weed and pest control. Um, and, uh, you know, and my also my reading from other city is, is that it didn't require a great number of more people, you know. So, um, you know, of course, I, I, I well understand your concern, Alderman, uh, about, uh, you know, a city that is short on workers. Um, but I, I'm, what I'm saying is I don't think it'll take that many more uh, to do this. And, um, you know, it, it will be well worth the effort. And it, yeah, I, you know, it, it doesn't mean, and I've not seen any evidence from any city that has ever uh, implemented one of these programs that suddenly they were short on workers and their parks were filled with weeds. I, I've not seen any evidence anywhere of that. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for that answer. That is uh, reassuring. Other answers? I'd like to just um, chime in that I think it would be important since um, I, as a parent of a, per, a son who went through the public schools, knowing that they students are required to do a certain amount of volunteer hours, I think it would be great for um, students to be able to do the healthy work in the parks as part of their volunteer hours. And um, so that's just another resource as well as volunteer. I'm a volunteer in the park. And of course I know Tower Grove Park is kind of a special park. We have lots of volunteers in the park, let me know, in Tower Grove Park. But I know not all, all parks do have those many, that many volunteers, but I would, encourage the use of the students in the public school system to get their community hours that are required for graduation doing um, helping because they need to learn it too and they need to learn about these issues to avoid chemical use you know that's my suggestion Barbara I think you had something to add yeah thank you um as I recall, when I was reading about some of the cities and Wesley that has beautiful gardens, it is, it's a change in thinking. And so even the beds, and that's why probably in the beginning of there might be extra expense, but setting up the beds with dense plantings of natives. And then once they're established, they nice. take off by themselves. And um, so it's a different kind of garden plant, planning and planting than what we, what's going on now in city parks. So um, that's my thought and, and it can be done and it can be quite lovely. And it might not look exactly like it's looked in the past, but it's gonna, it, it can look fine. Ms. Johnson, oh. you had your hand up. I, so as I've said, um, I noticed that there's been a lot more spray in the past year than previous. And I, I've noticed an increased number of spray, amount of spraying. And I think that um, it looked nice before, <laughs> but there wasn't a perfect brown circle of bare dirt around every single tree. And so I think it's, I mean, it is a question of aesthetics. If you like that look, then I guess you like the use of herbicides. And, but it doesn't, we can greatly reduce uh, the amount of chemicals without making the parks look overgrown or overrun. Um, and just reducing the number of trees that you, you know, make a big circle around and going back to how it still looked nice before you can you can have more man hours to devote to maybe hand weeding or um, mulch application which are both very effective it, it, it's 
And I think the it's so valuable to provide safety to the workers and the users of the park um, because the persistence in soil can be for years. And, and a lot of the workers, I don't think, because I've spoken with some of the workers in Tower Grove Park and asked them about chemical use. And one man in particular said, oh, we don't use that. And I knew for a fact that they, <laughs> that they used Roundup. And I just felt so horrible for him because he didn't, he sprayed it and he didn't know what he was spraying. Um, and I, I think it's really important that we protect people and protect everyone's health, our residents' health. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the speakers. And I like that closing comment, protect people. With that, Mr. Chair, I yield back. Thank you, Mayor Alderman Page. Um, so I did have a few questions. Um, so I guess my first question, um, Digger, because I know Daniel Romano is Digger. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, so you said that uh, you had sunshine in July of 2020. Is that correct? That is correct. That is when the first uh, sunshine request was made. And um, it took us a while to get any sort of records. Yeah. Okay. Um, and so I guess kind of my, my question towards that is because, um, so I, uh, and, and I'll speak of this later, but I, I do have some concerns of not having um, some of the members, uh, well, the commissioners of Parks, Forestry, and Recreation on here um, to speak. Um, I do know that uh, prior to running for office, um, some of you might not know or some may know, but I, I was working for the sustainability office um, under Mayor Slay's office. And one of the programs that we were working on was uh, really trying to cut back, um, if not eliminate 100%, cut back as much as possible on, uh, on our you know, pesticides and, and the Roundup and stuff like that. So um, from speaking with uh, Commissioner Hayes on this bill, um, and uh, he had mentioned that, you know, when he sent the information, when they were able to get the information and, and were from the Sunshine Request and were able to send it over, that basically he had put in there, you know, if there's any further questions or if, you know, wanted to work further on this, that he'd be willing to do that. Have, so my question, Digger, is have you had follow up with uh, Commissioner Hayes on this um, to, to kind of see what a next step from the Commissioner of Parks, Recreation and Forestry would be, or did it just kind of die out? Uh, I had a, at least, no, I had a couple of conversations with him over a year ago, and I had a recent um, email conversation with him too. Um, again, um, I was trying to get better records on the costs, and he just uh, seemed resistant to that. Uh, in my conversation with uh, Mr. Hayes, um, he has just continually claimed um, that we use very little of these chemicals and are, you know, now we have the records and I'd be glad to send those records. And as a matter of fact, I will to each member of this committee, I will send, um, we've compiled all the records um, uh, of the amount and type of herbicides uh, that they use in all of the parks. Uh, so um, I am willing to, um, you know, continue to speak with them. But um, every time I speak, and I, as I said, I speak to um, uh, Mr. Ryan of Tower Grove Park, they're always claiming the same things that we use very little. Oh, and, you know, natural methods have their problems too. And, um, so, and it just seems to get caught there. And, you know, so uh, that's why we went directly to uh, the Board of Aldermen. Thank you, um, Mr. Alderman Todd, for supporting on this and introducing this bill. Uh, I just want to emphasize that we've talked to people in other cities. We realize that this isn't a simple thing. We're not just presenting this bill and then boom, goes out of committee, boom, gets enacted. No we realize it's going to take a dialogue with all parties involved and speaking for myself and the no spray coalition and the other members that are here today, we are willing to take the time for that dialogue uh, no matter how long it takes, because we want, we want a healthier city. 
for ourselves and our children and the workers in the park. I truly appreciate that answer um, because I, I do think that, you know, I've read through the bill a couple of times and I have a, a half a page of concerns about it. Um, although I fully, you know, support the effort, um, I do think that there are some some things that need to be kind of worked on. Um, and I, I, saw I, I agree. And I have concerns too, as the bill is written. And I, I understand, I think the others, that this is a process, um, okay. you know, yes. And I, we are I here also, for that process. I just wanted to add to what Digger was saying about getting records. I had the feeling as I reviewed the records that the record keeping was not um, up to snuff. I mean, I think they're missing a lot of records. And we we really tried hard to interpret them as cl as closely as we could. But um, it was there were a lot of gaps. So I think that there's more being more chemicals being used even than what we have on record, because I think a lot of records were not kept or were poorly kept. Yeah, thank you. And um you know, and, and again, this is something that we worked on, and and I'd be curious to find out um, uh, exactly, you know, from I guess twenty uh, fifteen and sixteen is when I worked in the sustainability office, and we were working on drastically reducing the amounts that we were using, and we were doing that by uh, encouraging kind of a lot of native gardens and a lot of native plantings, especially in parks that had uh, like very steep slope hills that were not only dangerous to people driving tractors on them, um, but then our only solution was Roundup at the time. So we started doing hundreds of acres uh, throughout the city in native plants on areas like that that, uh, that were dangerous to mow and uh and we didn't want to spray um so i would be curious uh i would love to see that information that you've compiled um and then also kind of mention that everything the city purchases uh goes through you know our procurement office um so that might be a good spot to look for records because everything that the city buys uh will go through there um for uh for more information about like how much we're really using um because if we buy it, it it goes through one office um in the city so our supply division so um so yeah, if there are, oh, I guess my final question for the speakers, um, because it was brought up about the botanical gardens, um, I've worked quite a bit with the botanical gardens. They have, um, you know, I would say wonderful standards uh, as to trying to be uh, no spray and, and trying to do everything as, as natural as possible. Um, but I'm pretty certain they still do use small amounts um, in areas like parking lots uh, where or sidewalks where it's just, you know, it's almost, um, it would be very difficult to hire people uh, to just pull every weed in the parking lot. So um, I guess my question for anyone that has spoke, um, do you know, it, is the botanical gardens, are they 100% no spray or um, are they still using uh, minimal amounts of pesticides and herbicides? I'm uh, pretty sure they are still using. <laughs> Yeah, That's they right. they so they cool. absolutely yeah. do. Um, the uh, botanical gardens has been um, the recipient of uh, from what was the Monsanto fund to the Bear Fund. So, th um, despite all the evidence of the harm of glyphosate-based herbicides such as Roundup, and the immense legal liability uh, that that corporation has uh, incurred and the increasing evidence of its harm, they continue to use it. And uh, I think that they, I have also heard representatives from the Missouri Botanical Gardens defend herbicides, that they're not dangerous. And I, I think they, there is, um, you know, a conflict of interest going on there. And uh, I think that uh, since they are public, they should work towards, re, you know, eliminating all these pesticides. Um, there are ways of dealing with, uh, you know, uh, sidewalk cracks and, um, and, you know, there are, uh, for example, in areas like that, there are mixtures of agricultural grade um, uh, vinegar uh, uh, plus uh, a soap solution, and then you put in uh, salts that can be used, you know. Now, it doesn't work as quickly as Roundup does, but it is effective 
And uh, as I say, um, you know, I hope that we will, uh, you know, as we go through this process, look at cities like Wellesley uh, and, uh, you know, and um, there are a couple of others too that have used these pilot programs, South Miami, uh, successfully, and that we can deal with these problems without using the harmful pesticides. Thank uh, you for that answer. I'll oh, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question to Alderman Gunther. If we were to reach out to the procurement office, because I would really like to, I mean, that was something we talked about. How can we find out how much has actually been spent on herbicides and pesticides? Um, is there a certain person that we should email to ask for the information or what would be the best process to get, get more information from them? Because that was my thought too. Yeah. Clearly if it was purchased, we know how much there was and we know how much the cost. I'd be happy to get back with you on that um, okay. because I, I know the supply division. Uh, I know there's um, former Alderman uh, Carter, um, I think is is uh, in charge of it, but I would be happy uh, to reach out to him, figure out what the best way is, and then get back with. Uh, I really I appreciate it because if this does at some point go to the full board, that's going to be a question, I know, you know, yep. to compare costs. So I would really exactly. appreciate that. Thank you. Yep, and I have I have Digger's email. Um, okay. I believe already. Uh, yes, I do, and I also have the the no spray STL at Gmail, so I could probably just use that. So, but yeah, I would be happy. Either, to, either uh, way, is a good way to read us, reach us. Excellent. Okay, um, members of the committee, are there any other questions for uh, the speakers? Otherwise, we will just go right to uh, questions for Alderman Todd. And I see no hands. So um, thank you, everyone uh, that came out today to speak. Uh, we truly appreciate, uh, you know, your um, willingness to come before us and and your uh, dedication to a uh, safer and cleaner park system for us. So thank you for speaking. And we'll kind of move on to questions for Alderman Todd. So um, Madam Clerk, can you please go through the uh, list um, for questions for Alderman Todd? Going through the committee members? Correct. Autumn and Vaccaro, do you have any questions? No, I have no questions. Autumn Woman Tyus? Autumn Woman Boy, do you have any questions? No questions. Autumn and Bosley? Autumn Woman Clark Hubbard? Alderman Page, do you have any questions? Uh, no questions. I uh, got answers I needed from the speakers. Thank you. Alderman Peel. I have no questions. Alderman Gross. Alderman Walker, do you have any questions? No, ma'am, no questions. Thank you. All right, and we're back to you, Chair. Right, yeah, that leads me to have the question. So, um, Alderman Todd, so I do have some questions. Um, so, as I mentioned earlier, I, I really would like to continue this conversation with representatives, you know, from parks and forestry and rec recreation. Um, you know, I reached out to uh, all three of them um, in advance of hearing this bill. Uh, one of the things that um, Commissioner Jankowski with Forestry uh, that we had talked about um, was that as the bill is written right now, it would essentially um, make us quit treating uh, what were our ash trees, which we're treating for emerald ash borer right now. Um, so, you know, I, I know that it was mentioned by one of the, well, it was mentioned by Digger earlier that yes, we could go through an individual step-by-step -step process uh, for approving things, but um, I think there are some things that we do need to clean up. So one is the, you know, emerald ash borer is being treated right now um, in our city um, with an insecticide that will have chemicals in it um, that would be on, on the list of prohibited chemicals. Um, the other thing that uh, Commissioner Jankowski had mentioned is, is uh, what was mentioned about the honeysuckle removal. Um, so currently, you know, honeysuckle uh, is an invasive species. Um, the, the kind of best practice for cutting it is cutting it off at the ground and then you're putting a, um, uh, 
you know, a harmful chemical on the stump, um, which kills the root system. So we'd have to quit the way we are currently doing that. I've eliminated a lot of honeysuckle, and I do know that the roots are fairly shallow and they come up fairly easily, um, but it is just not the, the process or the method that we are currently using for removing honeysuckle. Um, so those are a handful of things that um, the forestry commissioner talked to me about. Uh, I did speak with um, Commissioner Hagley with parks as well, because I did want to find out if we are spraying around playgrounds or swing sets, stuff like that. Um, and uh, the answer there was it's very limited, if not at all. However, in my park that I you know, frequent daily, uh, Benton Park, we have a large swing set um, area that is uh, surrounded by concrete and filled with mulch. And when the Bermuda grass starts kind of creeping up around the edges of the concrete, um, I do notice that it suddenly is brown and dies off uh, without being dug out. So to me, that means they are spraying. Um, and, and if it's limited amounts, but still they are spraying. So I think Alderman Todd, that's kind of one of the things that I think we can clarify on this is, um, you know, maybe putting in there like, you know, um, a certain feet within playground equipment, you know, uh, 50 feet within playground equipment, we won't spray. Um, because I know that there are certain areas that, uh, like the sidewalks, the, you know, that, that they do spray, but, um, but I, I am, I'm, you know, very concerned about spraying right on play surfaces. So that is something that concerns me. Um, and then, um, I guess, uh, Alderman Todd, I, I'm also wondering, um, because from speaking with, uh, you know, the, the different commissioners on this, um, it was mentioned, uh, about the cost of uh, one would be the cost of, you know, the time it's gonna take to put together a environmental land management plan. Um, and so Alderman Todd, ha have you talked to um, anyone to get kind of a, a fiscal note on this? Cause typically our bills come with a fiscal note. So we know um, not only the cost of what, what it's gonna take to put together this plan, but then also, as was mentioned, if we're moving from weed whacking areas to hand pulling, um, the commissioner was very um, concerned about how many more people he would have to hire to hand pull uh, versus um, spraying like parking lots. So uh, Alderman Todd, have you spoken with them about trying to come up with a cost? Well, um, the answer is no. I, I, I had a meeting and uh, we could not, uh, I didn't get any fiscal information from them. The uh, anecdote, the information that I have we is that uh, we did get sued for $8 million. My, I mean, that would cover, if we could, I'm just using an estimate because uh, uh, the speakers, as they say, they've been trying to get accurate information and just haven't been able to get it. But we do have facts that, we were sued for $8 million. That's the first thing. I mean, that's a fact. And uh, just $8 million alone, we would be talking about using the same workers, but just changing the chemicals. So $8 million, if we got sued for a $1 million, $2 or $3 million, 10, that's 10 years worth of chemicals if we uh, balance it off. So since we couldn't get the information and we, I, I asked, we asked for it because we had a meeting. I did, I did attend a meeting. Uh, the uh, our speakers have been asking for it uh, almost two or three years. So we, but we do have information about how much it has cost the city already $8 million at least. And that's not including any other suits. So we're talking more than 8 million, but we have, the uh, fiscal information I have is that we have already paid out eight million. We've also shortened a person's life. We've also created um, problem, which we could get sued since we already know that these chemicals cause cancer. They cause uh, uh, asthma, a lot of respiratory diseases, Parkinson diseases, Parkinson disease. Once we know. And it has acknowledged that anything that happened to people, 
they can go to court and sue us and we're gonna be out, out of millions of dollars in the transition from uh, 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 poisonous uh, herbic uh, poisonous noxious herbicides to uh, less harmful, uh, non-harmful uh, weed killers. It's gonna be, we're gonna save money because we, so that our, the fiscal information we have is this number of suits. And also the fact that uh, we got information from other uh, cities that said that it actually, uh, in the long run, we do save money and, it's, and it costs, since we couldn't get dollar by dollar a fiscal note. Now, only people that would have that information is the parks department. Mm -hmm. So we requested it. We we did come, our fiscal note is the, the, the first of all, how much, We've been sued, and how much we've go, how much we've already been sued, and and also as the suit is final, so it's not like that's the fiscal note. If we've been and we're going to be out millions of more dollars, taxpayers' dollars, unless we change uh, those uh, harmful chemicals that kill people, make people sick, and reduce the quality of life for our residents. And uh, our question has to, and uh, our question has to be, uh, how much is one life worth? Our question has to be, the change will save us money. That is the question right there. And are we willing to invest in a different kind of chemical? And according to uh, one of the speakers, if I understood right, she said it costs about $10,000 for the chemicals that we are currently using. Let's see, uh, if once we change over, if it costs $15,000, it'll cut out the suits because we've already uh, taking care of the uh, danger of uh, being sued. So five thousand dollars, let's say a year, versus eight thousand. Uh, one, I mean, uh, eight million or uh, one million every year getting sued at a minimum. Uh, even uh, five hundred thousand, uh, even a hundred thousand. But one person getting sick and shortening their life is one person too many. One person being sick with uh, respiratory disease is one person too many. Uh, so, but if God forbid, I hope no one dies, but because then we're going to be really talking about millions and millions of dollars. Oh, but money is important, but how about that person's life? We need to worry. I think we need to uh, get to the point where we are putting human life over costs, which, won't, which we will recoup. It has been shown by other several cities that eventually you save money. Because then when we, not only are we being sued, if even if you lose the suit, we have to use staff to uh, defend the city. So you're still spending money. So the question is, are we gonna step, we need to always step up to the plate and say, look, our priority is people. We had the tax dollars. What's gonna eventually happen is we're gonna have to get to the point where we're gonna have to, uh, that money that we're spending on taxes is gonna have to be read. Uh, reinvested in people. It's going to have to be re. Whether it's going to have to be prevention again. I talked earlier on another committee. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I don't care. Uh, so the same thing with poisonous chemicals. This we can prevent. Once we prevent poison and death and sickness and chronic diseases we will save money, but we can never save money poisoning our citizens. We, that should not be, that shouldn't be one of the options that we are seeking. And my position is we requested it, uh, we requested and gotten the physical information that, that's available. I'm asking that the uh, this committee uh, vote on it and give us a favorable, give us, give a favorable um, approval because it saves lives for us last that's number one number two it saves us money and it, it improves the quality of life of our citizens and it saves us money in the long run and so the answer is i would like to uh move this bill forward and we can work on this bill as it gets to the board but i think i would like a vote on it today well thank you alderman todd um yeah i mean i 100 percent agree with you that you know the that for the safety and well-being of our employees and the and the citizens of the city, that it's important that we look into this. Um, but I, I 
I still am concerned about not having information from the directors of parks and forestry um, to be able to actually have, if we voted out a committee today, um, you know, then, then it's going to be difficult to be able to get this information in front of us uh, before it goes to the full board. Um, so I don't, yeah, I, I would like to see, I honestly, um, you know, what, what, um, Digger talked about earlier with uh, being able to send us all the the information that he's already acquired from his sunshine request about the amount of use that was put into it. Um, I would also like to see um, some of the uh, and again this goes to Digger some of the uh, examples of the plans that they've that the no spray coalition has come up with um, so that we can actually see kind of what these plans will look like and see if there are certain exemptions for, you know, something like treating the emerald ash borer or something for treating a uh, honeysuckle remover or issues like that. Um, so I kind of would like to see some of these ideas and plans first before it gets voted on, put in front of the full board. And then, uh, you know, and then we're basically just kind of uh, at a spot to where we can't make amendments to this bill. Um, we could make amendments, obviously, during perfection, but, but we won't have the directors in front of us to answer some of these questions. So that's kind of where, where I am on this right now. Um, Digger, I see you have your hand up. Do you have one more comment? Yeah, I just want to mention that, as I said before, the uh, bill does, uh, I forget it's in section five or six, does give a process for special use variances. Uh, almost That is a pretty standard part of any bill like this in any city because they face the same thing you know, invasive plants that are causing problems. Um, we, we need to be clear on who has that authority. And, you know, that's where the bill needs to be probably worked on a bit. Who has that authority and how they make those decisions. But um, yeah. It, yeah, that, yeah so that, so that, 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 those concerns are in there. So if you have a thing like the uh, emerald ash borer, it, you can be granted, it's, you know, and the thing is, I usually recommend that it's not a spray. That's one of the reasons we say no spray. Don't ever spray it. You know, when you treat like um, honeysuckle, invasive honeysuckle, you cut it and then paint it on. So yeah. there's no spray. And the other thing is that if, since it's in the bill that the book, uh, it can be uh, certain tree uh, plants like those ash trees and other trees that where it's totally necessary that bill does address that. So uh and so that's the um so that has been it has been addressed. Uh and for two years we've been waiting uh for we've gotten all the information that we can get as uh as a group. And uh if any more information come in, there's a the provision in there where that can be this bill can be uh modified by the next board. So I mean it's not the board, the all the people we, as all the people, always have uh, the right to a modified bill to make it fit in, fit the needs of the um, uh, of of uh, make it workable. But at the same time, uh, the address of the trees by that uh, have been uh, brought up by forestry have been addressed in the bill. So, uh, so since everything has been addressed, I think we should move forward and. Uh, deal with the uh, uh saving these lives and saving the city money because uh that'll be more money for us when we save money more money for us to use for other things that our city need and we are and will be we are in need of money all the time and this will improve the quality of life of our residents and make them safer so i, I uh so anything so since that provision about the plants and the trees is in there I think we should move forward and uh, and we've been working on the uh, fiscal note and we got fiscal information, but we've gotten all the information we can get. And the other thing is that, um, so that's the reason, uh, uh, I don't know anything else we can do to build is we can revise it if it needs revising and it, there's a provision in there just for that. Yeah, so it's the uh, section four line item B um, cause I actually, I wrote this down as one of the things I had questions about, um, where it's, you know, it says that uh, a written request for each use, um, and then the committee shall hold a hearing on each request as soon as, uh, practical following the receipt of a request. So, um, so that was one of the things I was, uh, also kind of concerned about is that, um, I'd like to have some sort of clarity on that, whether, whether it's, you know, the, 
does this mean that if if someone from the parks department uh is going to um spray a limited amount on the um sidewalks uh of benton park uh they had put a request and they go to fairgrounds park there's a request for that and then no it would be standard if they are going to uh uh, they would make a, a broad request because you have to have equal protection under the law. They, if they have a right to uh, spray in one part, they can spray in any part. But so uh, the only thing that would happen is they would just make a request, and then the request would be given if it's reasonable. Mm -hmm. And then that you has know, to come back in front of the committee. So they would go back to the committee. Of course, <laughs> uh, we need to make sure that. Um, uh, that uh, there aren't loopholes, and that the uh, that the that the bill is effective. At the same time, when uh, and uh, they would have to. At the same time, we're requesting more information and discussion. So rather than then, since we already have all the information we've been able to gather, there wouldn't be any more of a burden on them to uh, uh, clarify to get clear to uh, uh, request that uh, they spray. Uh, those trees or that if they want to spray uh and bend on the sidewalk uh then they would spray on the sidewalk all over the city because you can't uh according to the our law you uh, you have to have equal protection for the whole city you can't just have a one park in one area you have to have it on all areas or no areas so it right. wouldn't be like every time they do so it's not like every time they get ready to do something you're going to uh to have, they have to make a request that they're going to like the trees they if if um uh, if uh commissioner jankowski uh had problem with the trees and they had to have they had to have uh herbicide uh partners and some noxious spray well then he would request that would be exempt or uh, even trees and anything that you just have to have but if uh like you said you agree that cheer whether it be cheering or adults whereas whereas uh, our, our workers should be notified, like the worker that's going to have his life shortened, and they got eight million dollars. Eight million dollars when you when you're in bad health with cancer is not. Is, uh, I haven't had it, but thank goodness my health is good. But I certainly would rather have my health than eight million dollars. That's not and have my quality of life reduced. So that's what I'm saying. This is a city worker, whether it be a city worker, and we don't know how many people have. Uh, gotten sick because of these chemicals and didn't know it happened in the park we're just saying one we we, we are saying one we do know we could have saved money and could have uh helped our employee or for the city increase his quality of life but we do know that these chemical causes asthma and other respiratory yeah. diseases and that also can uh, shorten your life because we know that from COVID 19 those are underlying uh factors, some of these chronic diseases also are underlying factors for people dying early, are, are dying with COVID-19 when others don't. And we, you know, and then the quality of life of asthma is a very, uh, uh, it's not a very pleasant, I don't have it, but I'm, the people that I know, people who have it, it's not a very pleasant experience. Uh, Parkinson's, Parkinson's disease, a uh, cancer, uh, those type things, what I'm saying is that, uh, but now, since this, uh, we're working on trying to resolve this problem, and we know that this, these chemicals do cause cancer, we need to do everything we can, first of all, to protect our citizens. It would be like the cigarette industry, uh, knowing that cigarettes cause cancer and not saying anything about it. We are the representative of the people, and we are supposed to do everything we can to make sure that the people's tax dollars are used to improve their quality of life. Every citizen, because every citizen pays taxes, whether they work or live in the city, but if they eat, they pay tax. If somebody buy food from them, they're paying taxes for that person. So the point is, this bill uh, saves lives, it saves money, and it improves the quality of life of our citizens. And then it can be uh, tweaked as it goes along, because it'll be the good thing about this bill is there's a provision in there that says it can always be uh, upgraded. It can be revised without even writing a new bill. You can just come to the committee and just revise it. It's not, but uh, we do need to have a standard, and this help help us to defend ourselves from lawsuits because we cannot continue to be sued. Other departments have been sued for other incidents with citizens. I don't need to go into. We had another eight million dollars sued with the police department. That's sixteen million dollars. 
then yeah. we, we lack trucks to uh, pick up sanitation trash. We lack, uh, we lack those high lifts that we need to put windows in buildings all on all floors. We can't buy a hundred thousand dollar building truck like that and have a worker for a hundred thousand board up our building because we're being sued. That's 16 million I just mentioned right there. And so so we need to avoid the suits and that money can go. We talk about our employees need raises. Well, then we can't give them raises if we keep doing things that get us sued. So that's why, I, that's, that's um, why I'm supporting this. I'm asking yeah. that we that we an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. I'm asking us to start going on record uh, and saying, look, we're going to put people first. The reason we put people first because we represent people. We don't represent things. We put people first because we people vote. Uh, we put people first because people live in this city and pay taxes. And the people who come to the city, whether they're corporations or not, are employees, are also being paid by the city. Whether they, I don't care what department they work in or what position they hold, they work for the taxpayers. We work for the taxpayers, not they. I'm an alderman. I'm paid by the taxpayers. So that's what we need to do as city employees. Yep. Thank you, Alderman Todd. Um, I think we all understand how... Uh you know, some of the suits and some of the issues coming about uh, affect us. But I, I will ask though, so I basically because of uh, board bill 109, um, not being able to get uh, the speakers available that I've, I've uh, I'm going to work with Alderman Grass and try to get a hearing for next week for 109. Would you be willing to at least let us uh, take this week to try to get um, you know, not only Greg Hayes, uh, Alan Jankowski, Kim, um, but then also like I'd be happy to to work uh, on a couple of these issues that I see in the bill um, to try to make it a little bit better. Would you be willing to do that to just let's take a week to get some of the experts in? And I think also hopefully by then we might be able to get an answer on how much we've actually are purchasing so we know how much that's being used. Um, and, and also I want to find out uh, about um, how many people do we have in the city of St. Louis that are actually certified? Because in order to use Roundup, you have to be certified to use it. So I want to know that. Um, so I, I know I, I see your urgency on this matter right now, and, and I truly appreciate it. Um, but would you be willing to at least hear this? Uh, because next week, I promise Alderman Gross that we'd hear 109 as well. Would, that, would you be amenable to that? I hear on mute. we are doing that i think we need to make sure that you tell them to bring the information and bring the fiscal note there's no reason yeah why the fiscal notes all the, tell them to bring the information it is not our responsibility to bring the fiscal information it is their responsibility they keep the records we don't gotcha. and the citizens don't keep them and we shouldn't have to be running around looking for them gotcha so uh, uh so, so yes i'll be willing that. to wait until next week but we need the information. We need to move forward because people's lives are at stake. And I will also our uh, budget. Uh, uh, we cannot uh, make our citizens unhealthy. We cannot uh, bankrupt our city, which we are doing slowly. We're bankrupting our city uh, because we're afraid to make these. We're not afraid, but we are not making the hard decisions that we need to make in the interest of, of the citizens. And this is. Uh, I hope we can do this. Get the information get it done. And if the information is, if they can't come up with the information, my position, we have to go with the information we have because we cannot make them give us any more information. We All don't right, have I got authority. You. So, yeah. So, uh, as I mentioned earlier, I, I'm going to be hearing 109. Um, okay. Right now, it looks like it's going to be uh, Wednesday afternoon or Thursday afternoon, my two available dates. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to... Uh, yes, I would be willing to do it because I want all the information we can get. But And I think in all fairness to you as well as the committee people we are you deserve all the information but at the same time uh the people who had information please encourage them to bring all the information they have because we cannot we we have to go with what we can get from them yep all right and i i see in the chat here from uh miss o'reilly i'm writing that one down as well um how many employees we used to have in the past versus uh now and, and that kind of speaks to what we were talking about earlier with, um, you know, this past year, we haven't been able to have um, 
our, our basically our secondary weed whacking crews that we used to get through forestry, they couldn't hire people. So like we've had to start almost, um, you know, uh, subcontracting uh, companies out to be able to, to pick up some of the slack that we've had. So, so I will also put that on the questions, um, how many employees we currently have versus when we did more natural methods. So, um, okay. Uh, so I guess I will, as soon as um, I get off this call, I will reach out to, uh, you know, Commissioner Hayes, Commissioner Jankowski um, to get them to provide some of this information for us. Um, and then Thursday, Wednesday or Thursday, we will take a listen to uh, Alderman Gross on 109 and his speakers, and then we'll also uh, try to get this information from 174, and then uh, Alderman Todd. Uh, if we get uh, if we get no information from them next week, then I'll tell them we're taking a vote on it, and we'll okay, move forward with what you, we Mr. have. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yep, and then for the members of No Spray, um, I'm going to go ahead and email. Um, I'm going to get the information for the supply division. And then also email you my cell phone number because uh, I would like in the next week um, to talk about some of the things that I see as issues that I think we can clear up in there. Um, so I'll put that on there. Um, Barbara? Yeah, I had a quick question about getting information about costs. So it wasn't clear to me. Um, Alderman Todd um, asked you to bring the information next week about the costs, I guess, of the chemicals that are being used. Mm -hmm. So, and that would come from the procurement office. So do, yeah, I, do, I, do I need to get in touch with them also, or are you gonna take care of that? You know what, I'm gonna send them an email um, and just see if we can get that answered. That's probably better, yeah. Yep, yeah, okay. I'll, I'll see if I can get it, so. Thank you. Yep. Digger, one more question. Yeah, just adding on to that, it's the cost of the chemicals, the equipment that they need to spray it. And, you know, we should consider the man hours or workers hours that are used to spray, which could be switched, you know, to, um, you know, non-toxic uh, pesticide use. That's yep. all I had to say. Okay. I wrote all those down. So... All right. Um, again, I thank you so much for uh, your work on this bill and, um, you know, trying to create an environment uh, in our parks and our green spaces that is healthier for everyone, especially the youngsters. Um, and I 100% I agree with Alderman Todd that we're going to get to a point to where, uh, you know, lawsuits are going to be an issue. You know, mm -hmm. they're already an issue. I was called to jury duty last Friday, and it just happened to be a roundup case. <laughs> and I told them I probably couldn't hear it. <laughs> so, uh, so they let me go. Um, so yeah, so then uh, we will just hold off on 174 until we get some information. So then um, we have no resolutions. Uh, do any members of the committee have any uh, committee discussion that they want to mention? Um, I, I will mention one thing. Um, so I think the last meeting that we had had through parks, we were talking about the Forest Park Advisory Board. Uh, I have been speaking with um, Commissioner, ha or, um, C Commissioner Hayes about uh, that, and they still have a few open spots um, that they have not been able to fill. Uh, so we're not going to be hearing the Forest Park Advisory Board until they're able to fully fill the board. Um, so I know that was kind of just one of the open items from some of our last meetings. So um, do any of our members have any announcements? I have none. Okay, no announcements. Um, we have some excused members. I yes. Guess. Uh, so I would like to uh, excuse those members from absentee, uh, from necessary absentee for this meeting. Okay. And... If there are no other comments from members of the committee, uh, I'll ask for a motion to adjourn. I'll make that motion. Second. Second. It. All in favor say aye. 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 And before we commence, I think Aaron put in the chat, are we going to be invited to the next committee meeting? They are always open public meetings. They are, okay, thank you. Yep. Yep. All right, thank you all.